Good morning and, and welcome again. So I, I'm just, I, I'm, and I want to also welcome those that are going to be watching online. Uh, so uh, now if you have your Bibles, no, no brainer, we're turning to John and we're going to be in chapter 15. John chapter 15 as we continue our study in, in John's gospel. And this morning we're going to leave off, pick up where we left off last time. Last time we, we picked up, we're going to pick up at verse 18 today. But before we begin, nothing good happens without prayer. Amen? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. If, I thank you for what you're going to do today in, in each one of our hearts when we begin to realize a lot of the truth that you have in this passage today for us. So Lord, I just pray that you be with this servant, that you would just uh, let it be your words and not mine. Now, Lord, I pray that you would just, just give me your words uh, to speak. And, and Lord, I pray that you would just give us eyes and ears and hearts to hear from you uh, and help us to apply what we learned today. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for what you're going to do. And we just give you the glory for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So this morning, <clears throat> we're returning to the study in John's Gospel. And this morning, I hope we're there. hopefully we're going to understand why Jesus says that we are going to be hated by the world. Because that's exactly what Jesus says in John chapter 15, starting at verse 18. Now, in this passage, Jesus wanted to warn his disciples. Because, you see, Jesus knew that after he left... Uh, he left the disciples to return to heaven. They were going to have to. They were going to be facing some very severe opposition from the world, and perhaps because he had just told them that they would perform greater works than than he than he had, and we read that in John 14. Uh, they envisioned probably that the crowds were going to be receptive, and it was going to be smooth sailing, perhaps. However, Jesus knew they were going to endure tr tr just tremendous persecution. Not just from the pagan world, but also from the religious crowd. Also from the, from the Pharisees. Uh, uh, the Lord wanted them to be prepared for the, all of the hatred that was going to come their way. And there was going to be a bunch coming their way. That they, everything that they're going to encounter in the world and, and, and have a strategy of how they should respond to it before it happens. So, now if you were with us last week, you know that we that he had just told them in the in the verses before this. You'll remember what he said. He said, "I call you friends." It was very encouraging for them. I mean, he, had, he says, "I no longer call you servants or or a slave. I consider you to be my friends." And what a comforting statement! And Jesus has been making these comforting statements all along. But now, Jesus decides to warn them and basically says, You're my friends, but you have to know something as my friends. I want you to know this. You need the inside scoop. I'm surrounded by my enemies. And you need to know that my enemies hate my friends. And, and that's the way it is still today. You, you, need to know, you need to know that going forward is what Jesus is saying. He's telling his disciples, you need to know as we move on from this time, you need to know that. And I imagine that these words of Jesus, going from friend to this, probably caught him completely off guard, given that, that he had just described all of the wonderful promises that were theirs in him. They, they had been told that they would have unlimited power. They were told that they would be able to do greater things than Jesus did, things that weren't even possible when Jesus was on earth, thanks to the Holy Spirit. They, they, that they, that they, would, have, they would have peace and they'd have joy and they'd have all these good things that God would give them. These are all things that Jesus has been comforting them with. They were told that they would have access to these promises that Christ, that Christ could possibly, every, every promise that Christ could possibly put at their disposal. They were promised that they would have everything they needed. They were even told that they would have all the energy and the power and the ability to confront their world. Jesus had told them, don't let your heart be troubled. What a comforting thing that was when he said, don't be, he says, I'm, I'm here to give you peace. I'm here to give you joy and I'm here to bring you comfort. 
And then if you drop down to verse 26 and 27 in our passage right here, Jesus gives them yet another promise. If you look at verse 26 where he said, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Excuse me. So he even promised them that they would have the, the Holy Spirit to energize their witness, to energize their testimony, so that the Holy Spirit would be, the, be the, the catalyst for pushing this out. But lest they believe that, that they can go into the world and expect no negative responses or no negative reactions because they have all these promises and all of this and, and all of this power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells them in these verses that the world is going to hate them for their testimony. Hate them. The world is going to despise them. The world is going to persecute them. And in, and in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 16, if you go a little further, he says, he says that the world will kill you and, and believe that they are serving God by doing so. Uh, because they are going to be so immersed in their false religion. So here's the 11 disciples. They've been with Jesus at the Passover in the other upper room. Well, let's put it in its context. They're still, at this time, they're, they're, they've left the upper room and they are now making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus has been comforting them on this last night before he leaves them. Uh, and he leaves this world by crucifixion, which is going to happen the next day. This, this time, he's, this, is, this is the time that he has with his disciples to just get real with the disciples. And, and not only does he give them promise after promise after promise, but he gives them this great warning. It's, a, it's an incredible warning. It's a warning for us to, to know this, to be aware of the hatred of the world. It's a message that nobody wants to hear, including us. Amen? Now, let's find out why the world hates Jesus Christ and why it continues to hate those who belong to Christ. Like those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus and are willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him every single day. Why does the world actually hate us? Well, Jesus gives us a few reasons why, and we're going to look at a couple of two or three of them today. So why does the world hate us? The first fill in the blank is because we're not of this world. We are not of this world any longer. First, the, first, the world hates us because we're not of this world. Look at, look at verses 18 and 19. He said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Here we can see that the world hates us because we aren't part of its evil system. Sin inherently hates righteousness. Amen? Uh, just as false religion hates true religion. So just what is this world? The term world is not just, we're not talking about this globe. Right? We're not, it refers to Satan's organized system that is hostile toward God and his rightful king, Jesus Christ. This world, is, the world is the realm where evil reigns supreme. Satan and his evil angels are in charge of this whole world. And if you don't believe this world is all wicked and nasty and whatever, just turn on the news. <laughs> okay? I, I rest my case. The world is comprised of wicked people, wicked individuals who have aligned themselves against God, against Christ, and against the kingdom of God, and against God's people. That is what the world is. We have, we have some enemies in our in life as a Christian. The world, the flesh, and the devil, right? Okay, we have those problems. And the world hates everything that has to do with Jesus Christ has anything to do with God. Christ or any of those that would belong to him, the world is against us. False religion is at the heart of the whole system. It's a false religion. Whether it's atheism, idolatry, cults, witchcraft, satanic ideology, 
materialism, progressivism, secular humanism, woke ideology, or anything else, they all hate the only religion that is genuine, which is which is the only the only genuine self genuine is salvation in Jesus by faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing else. So we stand out. We stand out. You and I stand out. We're a sore thumb to the world. Uh, we don't fit into the system. We stand apart from the world. Why does the world hate you? Let's look at it again. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So Jesus says he, to his disciples, he says, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first. Don't be surprised. And the reason is it, is it hates you. The reason it hates you is verse 19 where Jesus said you're hated because you're not part of it. You're no longer part of it. You were of the world. And, the, and the, if you were of the world, the, the world would love you. But the world doesn't love you anymore because I chose you out of the world. The world hates you. Now, there's something you should know about this wicked old world. Okay? I, I mean, you just need to know it. The world is, is oftentimes very refined. It's culture. It's intellectual. It's very spiritual. This world is very spiritual. It is very religious. But at the same time, the world wants everything that is opposite of God. Everything. And particularly opposite Christ. And, and they aren't too wild about you guys either. You know that? They're not wild about me. I know that. That's why when you become a Christian, when you, when you first became a Christian, you probably felt uncomfortable in the same settings that you had gone to before where you felt absolutely at ease. Uh, and, and you sat there and you looked around and you said, I wonder why they treat me so bad. Why am I getting ignored? You know, why, 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 why I don't, I don't feel, I don't, I don't feel like I belong anymore. And guess what? You don't. You don't belong. Have you ever had the feeling that the whole world is watching you? Come on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have. Uh, and it's because they are. They're watching you. They're watching you like a hawk. And the world, despite its sophistication, despite its social structure and its religiosity, you need to know that the world absolutely hates you. Hates you. You know? And if you're a genuine follower of Christ, it's going to continue hating you. You've got to be a genuine follower of Christ. Though. John tells us in 1 John 5 that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's a vivid picture. That's a really vivid picture when you think of it. The evil one has control over the whole world. It's under the control of the evil one because the world is self-satisfied. The world is happy with ha making itself happy. The world is, is, is complacent. It, it, the world is apathetic towards God. The world is unaware of its own lostness. It's indifferent about hell. It is alienated from God. It has been seduced by the devil into questioning God's judgment and, and captivated by Satan and his evil. The world is resting in, the, in Satan's embrace. Right now, today, it's just resting in his embrace and it's a strong embrace. And it becomes very uncomfortable when you and I come along and we start sharing Christ. And disturbing that sleeping giant, right? We, we, we disturb the world and wake it up. The world doesn't want to be disturbed. When we, sh when we get out there and we start sharing our faith, and, we, and when we arrive and we begin to share the disturbing message of sin and judgment, we begin to wake up the world a little bit, and they don't like it at all. They are comfortable in Satan's embrace. And the world's only response is to hate the message and to hate the messenger. And such is the world's attitude towards Christianity. And don't think it's any different because it's not. And, and if, it's not that, if it's not the case in your own life, 
then the world, when it looks at you, is going to question whether or not you are truly a follower of Christ. It's a proven fact. The world will question it. They'll, they see right through it. Like I say, they're watching. In verse 18, Jesus began saying, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Now you need to know that in the original language, that word if, a conditional sort of word, isn't expressing an uncertainty. It's not an uncertain thing. You could replace that if in the original language, the way it is constructed, you could replace it with since. Jesus didn't say in the unlikely event that world hates you. The sense is more if the world hates you, and trust me, they will. They will. If Jesus was hated, so, or so will his followers be. Did the world hate Jesus? Yes, the world hated Jesus, without a doubt, because in less than 24 hours after making these statements, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be illegally tried for crimes he didn't commit. He is going to be mocked. He is going to be humiliated. He's going to be verbally abused. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be scourged. And he's going to be crucified as a common criminal. Yes, the world hated, hated him and still hates him today. They hated him. Uh, and, and, and the hatred that they hated him with is a certainty for you and me. It's a certainty. It's an absolute fact. If you're following Christ, this is a guarantee. I can guarantee you that the world will hate you. You're going against the flow. If Jesus was hated, so will his father will followers be. Verse 19 is the same thing. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. And you can be sure if you were of the world, the world would love you. The world would embrace you if you were of the world. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It, if, if it's, if the, it's, it's really when you get down to this, you look at this conditional statement as if it's a settled thing. It's a settled thing. It's a settled condition. The world loves its own. The world is involved in its own things. Every person born on this planet since Adam and Eve are part of Satan's system. They're under Satan's control. Their father is the devil who is the god of this world. Their entire way of living is centered around satanic worldly things. Now, you know it's, it's difficult to get people to grasp this. It really is, especially lost people to grasp this. Um, but if you look at Ephesians 2, at verses 1 through 3, it states right there, it discusses how we are all dead in our trespasses and sin. How Satan has power over our life. Um, how, how, unsafe, how the unsafe person has a Satan-centered e existence. It's, it's centered on, on, on wickedness and, and just free license to do whatever you want. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says it this way. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in, once you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, along with, uh, along, among whom we, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We were all once there. We were all once there. Therefore, when a man or a woman comes to know Jesus Christ by faith, they're delivered from that world. They're delivered. They're, they're, they're rescued from that world. As it states in verse 19, the world doesn't love you, uh, and, be, and, and the world won't love you because of it. Because you don't belong to the world. Because you're removed from the world. You are removed from their system. The system. As Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 13, he said, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
You've been separated out from the rest of the world. You've been removed from old associations and you've made new friends. And, and the wicked old world, it hates you. It hates you with a passion because you have newfound joy, because of the new kind of confidence that you have, uh, and because you belong to God, and because you have the answers and desire to share those answers with others who don't have the answers. And you confront them and, with that and, and, and with what God's word says about sin and judgment, and, and they're going to hate you for it. They're going to absolutely hate you for that. The world's reaction, first and foremost, first and foremost, is antagonism. The world is, is, is going to be just diametrically opposed to you. It's one of envy, jealousy, hatred, uh, since, since our freedom and our joy is so apparent, and theirs is non-existent. It's the same old story. People hate people who have all the answers, amen? I mean, sorry, my voice. And satanic, godless people in the world, in particular, they despise those who provide the answer when the answer is the antithesis of satanic activity, which is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the antithesis of that activity. And listen, if there's, if there's no opposition to your witness in the world, then you obviously don't have a visible testimony. If, unless it, you, we all should be getting bothered by the world. The world should be knocking on our door saying, I hate you, and you should know it. So they despise us first and foremost because we don't belong to the system. We violate the system, we confront the system, and living a pure life, we rebuke the system. Uh, it's a wicked system of this world, and Satan works against us, every single one of us. Okay, the second reason to why the world hates us is is because they hated Jesus first, and because and because they also hated Jesus, the world has turned against us because we represent Him. And listen. You need to understand that hatred isn't something that can be bottled up. You know you can't do that. You ever hated somebody? I mean, we've all been in the flesh. We just hated somebody. You can't. You can't bottle it up. You can't hold it in. You got. There's got to be some sort of out outlet for the for it, it's, it, it to express itself. And guess what? We're the outlet of that hatred. We are believers. Now. We know that the world has always hated Jesus Christ, but they have nobody else to direct their hatred against except those who, re who represent Jesus Christ. And as, as a result, the majority of the hatred that's directed toward Christ is really directed towards us. They haven't given up their hatred. They just have redirected it to all of us who represent Jesus. Listen, those who don't believe in, in Christ and hated him in the past they're going to continue to hate him in the present, and, and they're going to do it for no reason at all. They, they haven't given up their hatred. They've just redirected it, and you're going to be the brunt of it. They're going to look at you, and they're going to say, you belong to him, and I hate him, so I hate you. And believe me, the world's hatred is just as strong today as it was when Jesus was saying this. It's just as strong as it was 2,000 years ago. People are dying all over the world for their, for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 20. It says the beginning of verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you. This is in reference. Remember what he said in, in chapter 13. He said a servant isn't greater than his master. Uh, and back then he was talking about service. He was talking about serving them, serving one another, right? But here he's using the same idea to talk about persecution. He's saying, you know, they persecuted me. You don't think that if they persecuted your master that you're going to get away with not being persecuted. Amen? Uh, it connects us to Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. In Philippians 3, verse 10, Paul talked about the fellowship of his sufferings. He knew what it meant uh, to, to be uh, in, in fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. He said that I may know him. 
and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And Paul also said in Philippians 1.21, he said, for, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then later on in that chapter, in chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. So you see that Paul, he was committed to completing this. That there was, there was, that was a kind of discipleship, the kind of discipleship in Paul's life that identified him with the sufferings of Christ. He endured the same type of abuse that the world poured on Jesus and eventually gave his life for Christ. He lost his head. Nero took his head. He, he, he knew the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, which is something that most Christians, sadly, do not know. Most Christians don't have the privilege of knowing what it's like to be criticized or hated or persecuted by the rest of the world. And in this respect, it's, it's really hard for them to fully identify with Christ. It's a sad state of affairs. It shouldn't be that way. If you're living for Christ, you will be criticized, you will be hated, and you will be persecuted by the rest of the world. And, in, and Peter, in 1 Peter 2, says, for, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So Peter tells us that Jesus gave us an example to follow. Did Jesus suffer? How did he suffer? I'll show you. It says in 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus never reacted to suffering. He took, he took it willingly because he knew it was for you and for me, and that's the way that we're to take it. Christ not only died on the cross to pay for our sins, but he also died on the cross to show us how we should confront the world's abuses. And if the world abuses us, we ought to endure it quietly and, and consider ourselves blessed to have been, to been, to been chosen to suffer with Jesus. We don't want to do that though, do we? I mean, we don't. And so he says, don't be surprised if you suffer because I did. And the servant is not greater than the master. All right. Then he says in verse 20, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now, do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying, <clears throat> you're going to be in the same situation that I was. He says, some people are going to persecute you and others are going to accept, what, to accept the word that you have for them. But the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority will come after you. They will become hostile and they'll become infuriated by, by what you say. But there will always be some who will accept what you say. There is always a remnant in God's mind. So, you know, most Christians, we haven't experienced this because most of us, most of our Christianity, let's be real about it, most of our Christianity revolves around the church, mostly. And in the church, we don't sense opposition because for the most part, we all know Jesus Christ. But if you take, if you take it really seriously, your salvation and the, and the job that God has given you to communicate your faith. If you take it seriously to communicate your faith with other, other people, you are going to find out really fast how it impacts people when you explain that sinners, that they're, they're sinners who are facing a, a God's wrath unless 
they give their lives to Jesus Christ and receive him as their Savior and Lord. Most Christians, you see, aren't actually in the business of confronting their world. Most are not. It's a sad thing. Instead, we frequently keep our Christianity to ourselves, and therein lies the problem. We can't keep Christianity to ourselves. And so what does he say? He says, they're going to persecute you, but some, but some as uh, but some has, has accepted my word, uh, and since they've accepted my word, they're going to accept your word. So you're going to have a remnant. There's going to be people that are going to actually listen to you, and that's the joy of it all. That's the reason why we do it. But keep in mind that there's only going to be a few. Only a few. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are the few. You, you'll never, ever confront the world without expecting to get some sort of bad reaction. I guarantee you. And false systems of religion are all behind it. I'm talking about false systems that are being promoted by Satan. Uh, whether it closely resembles the Christian faith, which many do, many do, they closely, uh, they almost mirror the Christian faith, except they're just a little off, little off here and there. Or they're far from the Christian faith, which you don't even resemble the Christian faith. They're all systems that are antagonistic towards Jesus Christ. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You will be hated by all for my name's sake. And, and the world does hate you. The world hates me. The world hates us because they hated him first. And if he lives in us and he lives through us, I guarantee you, it's a guarantee, they are going to hate you. All right, then the third one is this. Not only does the world hate us, uh, because we're not part of the system and because they hated our Lord. But thirdly, they hate because they don't know God. They just straight out don't know God. And this is clearly the most difficult thing for the world to accept. You ask a person on the street, do you believe in God? They'll go, oh yeah, I believe in God. Especially the ones that follow false religions. And you, can, and you can imagine how this went over with the Jews, right? And we've been talking about this. When Jesus confronted the Jews, when it, it was always the message of Jesus. The Jews were always bragging about how much, about their relationship with God, how much they knew about God. And Jesus told them over and over and over again that you don't know God. That was the thing that enraged them the most. Now here's the real deep inner cause of all that hate. It's a complete absence of knowing God. Complete. Look at verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. You see, by saying all these things, he's saying that they are going to persecute you. These are the all things. They're going to persecute you. They're going to hate you. They're going to kill you because of me. And they're going to do it because they don't know the God who sent me. They just don't know. He's saying because of me, they're going to do all of these things. Now, conflict between man and God has existed since the beginning of time, since the fall in the garden. Because people are sinful. They're defiant. And they're obstinate. Seriously. Just look around. Very obstinate. The, they harbor deep-seated animosity toward God. Non-believers do not love God. They're, even, they're unable to know God. You say, so what about so-called religious people then? You know, what about these people that say that they're just so religious? 1 Corinthians 10.20, Paul said, what they do is sacrifice unto demons and not unto God. If you're not, if you're not giving God his due and then you've got some other form, it ain't going to work. False religion is the work of the devil. People who believe in things outside of Christian Christianity, I mean, really, 
even things that call themselves Christianity but, but, but deny important aspects of the Christian faith like the virgin birth of Christ or the deity of Christ or the, or the inerrancy or, or inspiration of the scripture. Those aren't people who are arguing the other side of things. They don't love God. They do not love God. Instead, they are people who hate God. They are governed by the devil himself. They, are, they all have a deep-seated animosity. It's born in them against God, whether they profess a crude sort of atheism or whether it's a shallow form of, of progressive liberal Christianity. They have this adversarial relationship with God. They're acting in opposition to God. They're on the same side as the devil. It's hard to tell them that. And to be honest, a person who doesn't worship the true God, as, as we read it in the New Testament, through Jesus Christ, is, is a, literally a practical atheist. No, no matter what else they worship, they're literally a practical atheist. Worshiping the wrong God is nothing more than practical atheism. People in our world who think they worship God are actually, are actually praising a God that doesn't exist. Not a real God. It is such a strange contradiction, isn't it? They, they say they believe in God, but, but they don't know Him at all. And yet they, they, they think that they have a relationship. In John 8, you remember what Jesus said? You say you know God, but you hate me, even though I'm God in the flesh. Remember that? He said in verse 19, he said, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He's talking to the Pharisees. Then over in this verse 54, Jesus said, And if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. If my, It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But watch what he says next. But you have not known him. What an indictment. Their love for God was a show. It was just sham. It was, it was a lie. And they didn't care about God. All they cared about was their system. A worldly system. And they were the people uh, who, can, who were considered very, very religious. They claim to know God, but Jesus says, you don't know God. He's not your father at all. What he, what he tell them their father was? He says, you are, you are of your father, the devil, and, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. In other words, Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is, you folks, you just don't have any knowledge of God whatsoever, or else you would, you would know me. You would recognize me, and you would honor me. You would worship me as God. The world worships a God that does not exist. That God is a designer God made up by the world. Acts 17. You remember when Paul arrived in Athens? It's a story where he, he stood up on Mars Hill. He spent all day looking at all the different, different idols they had. He said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every, every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Attaboy, Paul. Attaboy. Amen. Isn't that so typical of Paul? Because they were worshiping a God that they didn't even know. They even put it on the, I mean, they said, we're ignorant. We don't know who this God is, so we're just going to worship him anyway, right? They didn't even know him. But despite this, Paul recognized that they were very religious. That got his foot in the door. The, they worship a God that they, they've invented. They invented that God. And then they claim to worship God. Uh, and, you know, that's the way it works today. Okay, I just want you to know, this is how it still works with the world. They worship a God that they invent. One that doesn't, that turns a blind eye to their sin. Turns a blind eye to all of their rebellious, rebellious activities. 
And then they claim to worship that God. And, and, and in order to give the impression that they actually believe in that God when they've created it. He's a designer God. Nowadays, you know, I talk to people all the time about Jesus, right? All the time. And when I'm talking to somebody, you know, sometimes I get this, oh, my God wouldn't do that. I say, well, that's your God. The God of the Bible would do that, right? The God of the Bible says he'll do that. And this is something that I've told you so many times as we've been going through this, this Gospel of John, that if a person hasn't invited Jesus Christ into their life and accepted him as their Savior and Lord, no matter who that person is, no matter what they believe, they don't have personal knowledge of God at all. Period. No one has ever who has ever known God who's rejected Christ. No one. No one. Who who is God to them? Who is God to them? It's, it's, a, it's a designer God. One who's who's been made up. But Jesus, Jesus Christ is God in the human flesh and he was here so the world hates us because it doesn't even know God and that's why people hated Christ and that's why people hate us so first the world hated us because we're not of the world so and we no longer belong to the world uh, secondly the world hates us because it hated Jesus first and we belong to him we're his representative and lastly <clears throat> for today the world hates us because they don't know God. They just don't. They've been, de been deceived by the devil, uh, by the devil's counterfeit religion into believing that they do. That's why false religions are such a curse. That's why all these false religions are such a curse and why the devil is so busy promoting them. So the world thinks that it knows God, but it's godless and it's blind. And we're going to stop right there. And then we're going to pick up on the rest of this conversation next week. But let me, let me just say this. The world hated Jesus. They hated him because he exposed their sin. He revealed who they were, and they didn't like it. And when Jesus cast his, the divine light of his holiness on people's sins, they rebelled and they hated him. Because he removed all of the darkness and he shined a light right on what they had. And he revealed, he revealed what was in their hearts. They hate that. And instead of turning to him in loving faith and accepting his salvation and cleansing for their sin, they turned against him and they hated him for exposing their wickedness. And the world still hates Jesus. Nothing has changed. Nothing. And the world still continues to hate those who are his, who live for him, and who love him. So, if you're going to count the cost of being a follower of Jesus, you'll discover that true discipleship demands a willingness to suffer the world's hatred. Are you willing for, to, this, to, to, to take it on? To take on the world's hatred? Because it's impossible to be a friend of the world and, and, and still be a follower of Christ. You know that? It's absolutely impossible. If you're willing, not willing to take on the world's hatred, you're not willing to be a disciple, the disciple that Jesus wants you to be. That's all part of following him. You, you must be able to take it. Now, it's possible that some of you may feel like you've maybe overcome the problem of the hatred of the world. And, and as a result, you, you live your life as, as if you are a friend of the world. Listen, if you're a friend of the world, if you are actually a friend of the world, then you are no friend of God. And you need to know that. It's important to know that. You need to know that. As James said in James 4, he said, If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. 
And in 1 John 2.15, John said, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You'd be fooling yourself if, you, if, if you're in this boat. You see, Satan's subtle temptation is to make us feel at home in the world. At home with the system. At home with the world. But if you're wrapped up in the system, you violate everything that your salvation purchased. You violate everything your discipleship stands for. Everything. You can't be a friend of the world and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. So let me ask you, are you a friend of Jesus Christ or are you a friend of the world? Because I pray that you will be only the friend of Jesus Christ. Now let me close with this challenge for you. If you're a believer, and many of you are, a follower of Jesus Christ, I challenge you this morning to stand for Christ starting now. To stand for Him now. We need it so bad today. We need it so bad today. We need to stand for Christ. We don't have to stand for a different party, political party or anything. We stand for Christ. Don't worry about what the world thinks. You stand for Christ. Expose sin for what it is. You can expose sin for what it is. Reprove it. That means to call it out. Confront the world. Call it what it is, whatever the cost is to you. It doesn't matter what the cost is. And then ask the Lord for opportunities so that you could rub shoulders with people who need the Savior and pray for boldness when He gives you those opportunities to stand for Christ and share with others how they can have what you have. Because as we've seen today, it won't be received well by everyone. We know that. It will not. But some are going to hear this message and they're going to come to Christ. Amen? Amen. And, and, and I praise God for that. There's always going to be some. And listen, if you're here and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then I say to you, choose Jesus. Choose life. I, I, I urge you to choose Jesus. We don't know how much time we have left on this earth. We have no clue how much time we have left on this earth. You don't even know if, you, if you're... We're not guaranteed a moment past this moment. So, if you're alive today and you haven't chose Jesus... What are you waiting for? Choose Jesus. Choose life. Because what you do with Jesus is going to seal your eternity. And you can't change that. It, and, 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 and it's, it won't be an easy road when you come to Christ. And don't let anybody tell you it will be. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated. You're gonna, you're gonna, but you're going to have so much more. It's the best road to be on. It won't be an easy road, but it's the best road because Jesus loves you. God loves you. He died for you. He, he offers you forgiveness for all of your sin. And He offers you a clean slate and the promise of heaven and eternal life. What could get better than that? If you just choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. And I pray you will. Let's pray.